Um, our next speaker is uh, Cynthia savard saucier uh, the director of design at Shopify and co-author of O'Reilly's Tragic Design. Her wide range of experience has brought her broad recognition as a leading expert in e-commerce and user experience. And in addition to her day job, Cynthia is regularly invited to speak at events uh, not as good as this around the world. <laughs> Where her playful approach is both startles and captivates, uh, I'm really, really excited to see her. Please welcome to the stage, Cynthia savard saucier Thank you. So it all started in school. In school, we studied grid design in hopes of creating our own. And if you're lucky, you had like a single three-hour long class on user experience, and the teacher called it human-computer interaction. I studied design for four years and never even heard of user experience. After school, we take our best product, and we dump it into a portfolio, a beautiful thing that we're really proud of. But the bad stuff, the terrible designs that we, that we built and designed, we put it into an archive folder. And if you're like me, you rename that archive folder to something completely irrelevant to make sure that even your loved one will never find that by mistake. But fortunately, like this bad design work uh, is forgotten and forgiven. No one will ever have to deal with the consequences of the very bad design decisions that you made as a student. But by allowing us to forget and forgive these bad design decisions, our mentors and teachers are neglecting to address what's worse than average design or a B minus. We're not really taught that what we're building has a lot of power to influence how people are actually using our product. In medical school, the first fundamental principle that is taught is primum non nocere. Sorry for my Latin. Uh, in plain English, is first do no harm. This immediately reinforces that the patient is really important and that physicians have a lot of power over these patients. In contrast, what's the first thing that you learned in design school? For me, it was drawing in perspective. Not so much about power. But the bad news is that design can kill. And I mean that in a quite literal way, not like metaphorically, like the next time you see. <laughs> yeah. Design can actually kill. And I mean it in a very personal and literal way. So little story here. Sorry for those that have heard that in the past. Um, it's the same story again. <laughs> so in 2007, I was uh, backpacking across Central America on a shoestring with my very best friend, Fred. And in our quest to find all the little hidden gems and treasures, we found this beautiful hotel called Tortuga. Recommend the place. And in order to get there, you have to take a 15 minutes boat ride. We woke up to the sound of monkeys and birds, which was great. But then my friend ordered cereals for breakfast. We learned very quickly that the cereals contain nuts. And you probably have guessed correctly right now that my friend is very allergic to nuts. So fortunately, he always traveled with his injector. Uh, we called them EpiPen, but his was a twinject. It includes two doses in it. But he always told me that should anything happen, he has the one to inject himself. But what we don't know is that once you start actually having a reaction, you have muscle spasm. So he was not able to give him the injection. So he handed me the tube, and he was like, you have to give it to me. Not sure how familiar you are with this thing, but what I remembered was a video that we were shown when I was 12, and they showed it on an orange how to use it. No? no, Yeah, <laughs> someone's nodding. I'm not the only one. <laughs> That's what I was expecting type of thing. It's not exactly how it works. But still, I gave him the, the injection, and it worked. And I knew that this would give us 10 minutes. But you might remember that we're 15 minutes away from the nearest city. So we jump on the board, and 10 minutes later, 10 very long minutes later, um, I know I have to give him the second dose, the second injection. So as we're literally speeding on the water on a very small boat, um, I'm trying to give the second dose, and it's not an auto-injector, it's an actual syringe, and it doesn't work. I try 
multiple times and it just won't work. So imagine the scene at this point. We're going really, really fast on a boat. The, the ride is really bumpy and I really remember like my hair was whipping me in the face. And there's two girls that are sitting behind us. I don't know what they're doing on that boat, honestly. And they're two French tourists and they're screaming and yelling and crying. They don't understand what's happening. And then there's the boat driver that is talking to me in Spanish, a language, a language that I did not master. And then there's my friend sitting next to me and he's wheezing and he asked the tourist in the back to hold his hand. And I don't know what to do. So I ended up reading the instruction manual. This is what it looks like. And I'm sorry, like you might not be able to read because the text is very small, but that's the actual experience that I felt. The text is very small and it's wrapped around a tube. And you can imagine if my hair was whipping me in the face, what was happening with that little piece of paper, super delicate that you have to hold, like you, it might save someone's life because it might. And I'm in full panic mode, so I'm reading it. And step nine of 14 says the seven most important words in my life. Slide the orange color of the plunger. But honestly, at that point, that's what my brain is reading. <laughs> I remember feeling so mad at myself, telling me that I've studied plastic injection molding. I should know how a syringe, a plunger works. Industrial designer here laughing. I should know what a plunger is. I should know how to do this thing, and I consider myself not a complete idiot. But out of option, I sort of went to panic mode, so I started stabbing my friend with the syringe. And 11 times I did this, until it broke in his leg, and the sheer pressure of the thing breaking ended up giving him the medicine. And that's how I actually saved my friend's life. And let me tell you one thing. If I had wanted to save someone's life, I might have become a nurse, a doctor, maybe a firefighter, if they wanted to accept me, but not a designer. At least that's what I thought before I realized the cost of really badly designed stuff. Thankfully, we made it on time, and this is a picture I took after. <laughs> I say it because the first time I gave that talk, I didn't, and then people asked a question in the end, like, is your friend okay? And I was like, yeah, he's cool. <laughs> Survived, no one died. <laughs> um, so we made it, and it's fine, but it could have gone really, really wrong because of a terrible design decision. So I now know, because I went on YouTube and looked for it, that all I had to do is to remove the orange color of the plunger. But I couldn't find this orange plunger, maybe because it's yellow, maybe because it's step nine out of 14 written on a super small, tiny piece of paper, maybe because I'm, a, I'm on a boat, with people screaming in different languages at me and my friend is dying. Maybe because I thought that this plastic part was simply part of the injector. Or maybe because it's just like a terrible design. And every time I tell this story, I feel like I have to tell you that I'm not an idiot. I feel I have to show you that I'm not like the black and white lady that doesn't know how to fucking peel an egg. <laughs> So I went online and researched a little bit, and according to a study done by University of Texas, out of all the researchers, uh, all their, of all their participants, sorry, only 16% were able to properly administer themselves the injector. 16%. The most common mistake is, believe it or not, believe it or not stabbing your own finger instead of your tight. The needle is long enough that it will actually go through. Which wouldn't be that big of a deal, but the problem is that the medicine is not there anymore and you haven't received it. So I would argue that this is not the user being stupid. The complex systems that we're building, they're managing parts of our lives that are more vital than ever. And designers play a big part of this. 
Therefore, it's super important that we plan for what we can't see, that we think of the widest scenario, the widest range of scenarios that we can think of. And it's everyone's responsibility to identify these risky scenarios. Let's say your company works on something and you are not on that team, but you think of another feature that might be a problem. You think that someone might abuse the project in a certain way. It is your responsibility to go to that team and tell them, hey, have you thought of da da da? You might think it's obvious, but it's not to everyone. And if you don't do it, hopefully it doesn't kill anyone because you might think about it later. Oh, I thought that someone could stab themselves. That would suck. Thankfully, we have tools, yay. Um, for designers, this is quite a common one, user journeys. So they're quite popular and they're a great start, but unfortunately, it doesn't cover all of the use cases because it tends to focus on the correct use. So I have two other tools that I would suggest you use. The first one is the use error chart. So when we build product, we tend to focus on this slice of the use error chart, which is the intended correct use. This is when the user are well trained, when the systems are healthy, and when the product is used in the intended way. But what you should do is think of everything that is um, reasonably foreseeable. So we have to design intentionally for mistakes, for laps, for slips. We have to be as conscious and intentional about it as we do for the correct use. On the other side of this uh, chart, you have what I consider the unreasonably foreseeable use case. So these are people that will try to abuse your product, that will try to use it for unintended application. Um, and this is actually really hard to plan for. Um, I'm not saying you should avoid planning for these scenarios, but it is fair to say that it would be deprioritized. This tool should be a good way to try to gain traction around thinking about other scenarios when it comes to product design. It's also great when you do user research. So you know this, I don't know if you've done user research before. It's a designer group, I hope, yes. But the first thing you do when you have a new participant is you welcome them and you take a soft voice. And you're like, welcome. I know it's a lab, but don't worry. You try to reduce the lab effect, the lab effect. so you're like, would you like a coffee? Don't worry, you can do no mistake. If you do any mistake, it is not your fault. It is the designer's fault. They're not watching. And then they do the task, and if they don't make it, it's okay, don't worry, no one's gonna die, all is good. And this is great, because obviously you don't want like, to tell the participant that someone might die if they make a mistake, not be the best experience. But what if you just told them for one or two tasks that they have a time limit, or that you're running late, or they will get an incentive if they complete the task faster? By creating a small amount of stress, you might get very different results. So identifying the potentially risky scenarios is great, but again, it's not enough. There are other tools we can borrow from other disciplines. So for example, the fall tree analysis is used in aerospace in uh, pharmaceutical industries, and it is quite great. I really recommend it. So it works in a very simple way, and it's uh, usually like there's a bunch of uh, standards that are defining how you should be using it, but that's a very simplified way that actually works really well. So let's use our injector, for example. What you do is that you list all the potentially damaging uh, situations and all the factors leading up to that situation. So for example, the worst thing that could happen is that a patient dies. And you list all the reasons that this could happen. So failure with the first dose or failure with the second dose. I'm going to use the I poke my thumb example here. What you do is you end up finding the root cause for what, why someone is actually poking themselves instead of their leg. And when you do, people are actually confused by what is up and down. You look at what are the safeguards, sorry for the, for the contrast. So you look at what are the safeguards that are in place. And if these safeguards are using only a single uh, type of feedback, you should consider adding another type of feedback. In this case, there is an up arrow, and there's a word up. They also use colors, but colors are not like really great for people in stressful situations. 
So what could you do instead? Well, you could try to use the form and make it affordable. I've never seen someone say, oh, I grabbed my cup on the upside down. Like people know a cup, how it's supposed to be held. Use affordance in order for people to hold their device in the right direction. That'd be a free idea if <laughs> pharmaceutical industry is listening. Go ahead, pick it, take it. So this is how you build user error resilient software and product. So when design kills, it's easy to like cast blame and say like the designers there are really terrible and I would not have done that. But in reality, the designers are no better, worse than you and me. They're exactly in the same situation than we are. And it's oftentimes not that the designer is bad. It's a failure of imagination. It's really a failure of thinking of how things could go wrong. So use error charts and faulty uh, and faulty analysis are great tools and they're amazing at not killing someone but i'm a little ambitious and i think we can go a little bit further than just not killing our users i'm quite ambitious so design can actually be cruel and a colleague of mine had a very unfortunate example of how design could be cruel with her so one day she was at work and she received a phone call and her sister, who had been battling cancer for a very long time, was in a very critical condition. So the doctor said that she had to drive as quick as she could from Ottawa to Toronto, which, for those who are not familiar, is a long drive. So as she was on her way, she received a call from her sister over FaceTime. She was calling her friends and family to tell her last goodbye. And Serena, recently, well, after the fact, shared with me that she was very grateful that technology had evolved, that she was able to have those critical moments through this small device in her pocket. This thought alone sort of blows my mind. But however, while she was on the call with her sister, this, the call was interrupted and this message kept popping up. So do you remember when FaceTime launched? There was this really nice advertising. It showed great, happy friends talking to other loving, happy friends. I'd be curious to see what that would look like if stress and emotion was running high. <laughs> this is a video. This was a video. It's not a video. Well, okay, it's not a video, it's a still. <laughs> so just take a moment to reflect on the most important phone call in your life. What was it? Was it you announcing to your family that you just gave birth? Was it your partner asking you to marry you? Over the phone? <laughs> 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 or was it maybe that you were just accepted for a new job that you really wanted at Shopify, we're hiring? Or was it your sister telling her, telling her last goodbyes? Sorry, losing my mic. So now imagine getting cut short in that conversation. Not available for FaceTime. What does that mean? Do you have to change anything? Do you have to play with your settings? Is the problem on the other side? Losing my mic again. So you're stuck on your side, and you have no way to communicate with the other person to tell them that, hey, I don't know what's happening. So it's in this moment that we realize that this thing there, this is design actually, that error message is definitely design. Simple takeaway. Error messages are important. They are. We tend to say, like, we'll look at them in the end. They're not that big of a deal. But what you realize is that you can spend three years working on checkout and you still haven't designed everything because there's a bunch of use cases that keep adding up. When you've identified that an error state is required, Make sure you include any necessary instructions. Don't withhold any information that might be useful to anyone. And especially, always, always include a next step. So design can kill, design can be cruel, and design can be infuriating. Infuriating, that's a hard one to say. For example, when this happens, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Or when this happens. <laughs> 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 
Honestly, when this happens to me, it makes me want to throw my phone out the window. And it's actually quite funny once you take a picture and share with your designer friends. But it can also have like actual consequences again. So this is an example of someone that wanted to retrieve their visa. But the problem is that with a security question, ask for the, five, the first five letters of their surname. I have a very long name, so that's not a problem for me. But that person has a five-letter surname, so they could not retrieve their visa application. And that's in the States. So you might be thinking, like, oh, well, American probably designed that with an American-centric design in mind, and like American have longer names, da da da. Well, these are five presidents that have surnames that are shorter than six characters, but thankfully they don't have to retrieve their visa process, their visa application. And some people have short names, and some people have long names. So Ivan Rodrigo Gonzalez Loyola Perez was not able to buy a plane ticket because his name is too long. But then, I don't know about you, I have a very long name, so that's a personal issue I have. If I don't put my name exactly how it's supposed to be entered, uh, I will be stopped at the gate, at the security gate, and they'll be like, oh, not the same name, even if it's just like a letter missing in the end. My name is 21 character, and sometimes there's a limit of 20. So it is a natural problem. So of course, these are names. It's not that big of a deal, you might think, but this is infuriating. This just puts more stress on people's life. And these are design decisions. They might be taken by the designer, by the developer. You should care about this, probably. And avoid any arbitrary rules. If you put a number in a limit, you should have a reason for that number to exist. Where is there a maximum of 39 characters there? I often see that, like we're in a design review and then someone's like, oh, there's a limit of 340 characters. And I'm like, why? Where does that number come from? And more often than not, people don't know. Someone at one point said, well, there has to be a limit, so I'm just going to put something there. But the use cases changes and the code gets reused and the same page gets reused for the same thing, for a different thing, sorry. And if we don't keep track of those limits, then these things happen. And again, it's easy to say, like, it's the user's problem. It's easy to blame the user for, their, for them being idiots. And there's so many jokes that we tell ourselves as designers. Have you ever heard of pe uh, PEBCAC? It's problem exists between keyboard and chair. <laughs> or a type 16 error. This one is a famous one. So type 16 error means that the error is not in the computer, but 16 inches away from the computer. <laughs> and if even the army has one Delta, Delta 10 Tango, which is idiot. So although like this is obviously like funny as we're talking about it right now, but I've heard these things in an office space. And talking that way about our users creates a different cast of the intelligent creator and the stupid user. This indifference can create irresponsibility, prejudice, intolerance, and contempt. So it might be the time that we actually change that joke and that we acknowledge that it might be a type 16 error, but 16 inches away from the creator screen. Thank you.